grace and peace to you all this morning. Um, thanks for coming to worship with us here on Zoom. Welcome to friends that have come before and friends that we haven't met, met yet. Um, my name's Kat and I'm currently training for um, ministry with the Church of Scotland. And I beg your patience and forgiveness this morning as I learn new skills with the with the technology. My husband is usually my tech support, but he's taken the kids out so that you can hear me and I can have some peace whilst we do this um, this service. But I'm just juggling all the, the screens and pieces of paper. So if you can't hear me or see the right thing, just just raise your hand and let me know. Um, the building is closed, but the church is still very much open at St. Stephen's. So as Jesus is the light that shines in the darkness and the peace in our troubled sea, let's come before him and pray. Loving God, our souls sing out in worship and all of creation bursts forth with praise. If you look with compassion on those who suffer, you shed tears of sorrow for those in grief and you reach down into the dark pit of hopelessness. You kneel in the dust to lift up the humble and shoulder the burdens of those who are bowed down and crushed. Great and mighty is our God who meets us in weakness. Sure and strong is our God who meets us in our fear. Glory be to God who stands shoulder to shoulder with those who are in pain who opened his arms wide on the cross to hold all the hurts of the world. God of mercy, forgive us if our words and actions have injured others. God of mercy, forgive us if our silence and inaction have injured others. God of mercy, forgive us if there are times when we have kept our distance from those who suffer if we've spoken hollow words to those in pain in order to comfort ourselves. God of mercy, forgive us if we failed to do justice, love, mercy, and walk humbly with you. God of mercy, forgive us and renew us. Use our mistakes and our brokenness and help us to live in each moment and every circumstance with lives of gratitude and love. And let's say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And we're now going to have a scripture reading from Pamela, if she's there. Perfect. Today's reading is from Revelation chapter 2, and it's verses 8 to 11. I'll just give you a minute if you're trying to find that in your Bibles. And the NIV version that I've got is on page one, two, three, four. So <clears throat> it's entitled To the Church in Smyrna. To the angel of the church in Smyrna, write These are the words of him who is the first and the last who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful even to the point of death and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who over overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. Amen. Thanks, Pamela. Right, well, I have an apology to make before, before we start. Um, my lecturer told me recently that after you've done your first 50 sermons, you look back at them and realise how dreadful they are and you rip them all up and throw them all away and start again. 
And, and I calculate that George has probably done well over a thousand, if not at least double that in terms of sermons. So he's well beyond his first 50 dreadful sermons. And um, my confession this morning is that it's sermon number four. I'm still on one hand. <laughs> so I've still got a very long way to go. So I beg your patience this morning as I as I learn these new skills and negotiate this technology and try and bring God's word to you. So we are studying the first three chapters in Revelation just now, and George has ably guided us through the prologue and through the first letter to the church in Ephesus. And today, Pamela read us the letter to the church in Smyrna. And the thing to remember with these letters is that they were real letters to real people from someone that they knew, from a a friend that they knew and trusted, from John. And it made me wonder if you'd ever received a a gift of an encouraging letter from someone that you loved. My mum is a real letter writer. She knows when to write them and she's a real encourager and her words have the ability to pick me up when I'm down. And I wonder whether you've ever experienced that, just a a text message or a wee note or a phone call or a letter that's just that's just been there for you when you've really, really needed it. And I just want you to think about that and just kind of hold on to those words that kept you strong when you needed them. Because this letter that we're looking at this morning is that, but it is so much more than that. The letter this morning, yes, it's encouragement from a trusted person, but this is a letter from God. At the beginning of the book of Revelations, we're told that John received this message from Jesus who told them to write these letters. So this is a letter from Jesus to this church. Is that not amazing that God takes the time to write letters to his church, to his people? The creator of all things takes time to speak individually to his people. I wonder whether you've ever had a message from God, either directly or through a friend, a word of encouragement when you have needed it the most. I am fortunate enough that I have. And I can tell you the message keeps you going and going and going. It's like his word is the best Duracell battery out there having a word from the creator of the universe just for you, like we're reading here, is the most powerful of things. It changes history. It saves lives. It changes people forever. It can make people like me quit their job and go back to university and start training for a new job entirely. It's crazy. The word of God shapes history. When I worked at Bethany, a colleague of mine who'd been working there for a long time, he was thinking of moving on and getting a new job. He was really tired. He was tired of the same old, same old, you know. He was exhausted. He was exhausted by the constant needs of people with real complex issues and addictions. And he thought he'd served his time. He'd been there a good while. And he thought it was time to move on, frankly, to do something a bit easier. And he was applying for new roles. And at church one morning, a friend came to him and said that God had placed a passage on his heart just for him. And the passage was Galatians 6, 9. And that passage reads, let us not become weary of doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. And this passage really spoke, don't give up. And he went to his home group the following week. And guess what passage they were studying in their home group? Galatians 6, 9. And a few days later, he took a book off the bookshelf and an old bookmark fell out. What's on the bookmark? Galatians 6, 9. Let us not become weary of doing good, for in the proper time we will reap the harvest if we do not give up. And he took the hint, strangely enough, he took the hint that God didn't want him to give up. God's encouragement gave him the strength to carry on, to keep on serving in his name. He was weary and he was ready to quit. But God stepped in and he said, not yet. Let me 
recharge those batteries for you. Let my word just speak into you. And God does this again and again, the whole world's over. He knows each of us here intimately, and he can speak into the detail of our lives. And the amazing things about these letters that we're looking at is that they're written for a specific audience. And yet you and I can read them and recognize them and we can apply them in part. There are parts of each of these letters that we can apply to our lives and to our church here now. So let's remind ourselves of where we're up to. What's the scene? These letters were written about 90, 95 AD. So sometime after the death and resurrection of Jesus. And John's writing these letters from Patmos, where he's in exile. And just to be clear, he's not lazing around on a beautiful beach, sipping sangria and writing letters to pass the time. He's probably doing some hard graft in the quarries. There's a climate of intense persecution for Christians, and John would be made an example of. He would have been broken. He would have been exhausted at the time of writing these letters. And many of the churches were suffering. This was way before Constantine recognised Christianity. Emperor Domitian was around, and even by the standards of the day, he was regarded as a bit of a megalomaniac. He had to be worshipped as a god. Persecution of the Romans, often led by the Jews, was sporadic and in geographical pockets. Sometimes it would be openly hostile, and other times it would be more subtle pressures to conform. In Smyrna, that we're looking at this morning, it was openly hostile. Martyrdom and suffering was the climate for the church there. The church would probably have been struggling to keep going. They were weary and scared. Jesus had left them in bodily form about 50 years earlier, and they were expecting him to come back. 50 years waiting, 50 years on the fringes of society. And into this theme, God sends his letter. He sends his message of hope, a message of honesty, a message from his eternal perspective. And he reminded them who he was and revealed his truth to them. Once again, he gave them confidence where there was doubt and courage where there was fear. These seven letters that we're looking at were sent to a selection of dying churches, dodgy churches, lukewarm churches, morally compromised churches, and desperate churches. Churches that were far from perfect. They're all failed and flawed in some way, but God stands by them, and he sends his message of love and encouragement. Smyrna was regarded as the loveliest city in Asia Minor, the crown or the ornament or the flower of Asia, they called it. It was the greatest rival to Ephesus. It's got a great geographical situation and it commanded a lot of very rich trade routes. And it's at the end of the long arm of the sea and it's got a small landlocked harbour within it, which was safe. It was a free city and it was powerfully loyal to Rome. And it was beautiful. The hills rose up behind it. It was covered in temples and noble buildings. And the most famous street was called the Street of Gold. And at one end, there was a temple of Zeus. And at the other end, there was a temple of a god that I can't even pronounce, Cybele. There's magnificent architecture. Temples to Tiberius, Zeus, Apollo, Nemesis, Aphrodite, Roma, you name it. It was there. It had everything a city could want. Trade, beauty, political status, religious status, culture flourished there. It had a magnificent public library, a stadium for games. It was a home to music and theatre. But this was a dangerous, dangerous place to be a Christian. The enemies were numerous. There was a significant Jewish population, which at that time was hostile to Christians and they were influential in the city. One of the first readers of this letter was probably a young man, he would have been young at that time, named Polycarp, and he went on to become bishop of Shmona. 
And sadly, he also went on to become the most famous Christian martyr of the city. He had a dream, according to, to the works, he had a dream, a premonition, a warning that he would be burnt alive. And he was. In the public arena, at the public games, in this beautiful city of music and theatre, he was given a choice. To curse the name of Jesus, or to make, and to make a sacrifice to Caesar, or die. He was 86 years old. According to the written records at the time, his reply was, you threaten me with a fire that burns for a short time and is quickly quenched. But you do not know the fire which awaits the wicked in the judgment to come. Let's not be in any doubt. A beautiful Smyrna, educated, cultured, rich and loyal, was a very difficult and dangerous place to be a Christian. But the seven letters that we're looking at, this is only one of two in which there is undiluted praise. There are no commandments to change. It is just to continue to be faithful. Do not be afraid. And words of honesty and encouragement. In verse nine, Jesus says, I know your afflictions and your poverty. And the word for affliction here is the crushing beneath the weight, the pressure of a situation is literally crushing them down. The heavy pressure is squeezing the faith out of them. And I wonder what is crushing you just now, what weight is bearing down so hard that it threatens to crush the faith and life out of you. Is it your loved ones who can't understand this crazy faith of yours or they're behaving in a particularly challenging way? Is it this pandemic making you wonder where God is amongst it all? It's just so hard. Is it the claim of atheists that science have explained everything and there is no room left for God? That we only exist in the here and now? That is a depressing thought. Jesus says here, I know your afflictions. I know your afflictions and your poverty. And the word here for poverty is one that means complete destitution. They had nothing at all. The Christians were often from the lower classes and their possessions would be plundered and attacked by mobs who would wreck their homes. Poverty and Christianity are closely connected in the New Testament. Jesus tells us, Blessed are you who are poor. In James, he tells us that God chooses the poor of this world to be rich in faith. And certainly this verse goes on to proclaim that, doesn't it? It says they are rich in faith. Remember that this letter only encourages them to continue to stand firm. And sometimes just carrying on with what you're doing just keeping going day in, day out, year in, year out, conscientiously and loyally following God, staying true despite the madness around us, resisting being crushed under the weight of the here and now. Sometimes that is magnificent. And God sees it. And he sees you resisting being crushed by the world. And he sends these love letters to you to encourage you to be strong, to hold on. But despite the encouragement, there is more suffering to come for the people of Smyrna. God doesn't say it's going to go away. He says, do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. They're going to be imprisoned for 10 days. And it's not thought to be a literal 10 days, but it means a limited amount of time, a short period, and that it will pass. It's a warning and a promise. It will come, but it will be limited. It will pass. But let's be clear, this isn't a 21st century British jail. They won't serve their time and then come home again. Their sentence might well be a prelude to death. And let's be clear, this isn't a threat. God is not persecuting them. That is not in God's nature. 
this is not a punishment. Persecution is not a Christian behavior. It says the persecution comes from the synagogue of Satan. That is people claiming to be God's people when they're not. He's saying they call themselves the assembly of God, but they're actually the assembly of the devil. God is not doing this. Their afflictions are coming from an evil place. Terrible things happen when religion becomes the means of evil. When people use God's name for terrible things, God is not persecuting them. The people of God are not persecuting them. Evil people are, and they're doing it by falsely claiming the name of God. And we've seen it throughout history. Evil people claim the name of God as a way to cover their evil ways. But we know the fruits of the Spirit. The children sing it in that crazy song, don't they? We read them in Galatians 5. The fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Do not be deceived. The crushing, the afflictions, the danger comes from the synagogue of Satan, not the temple of the Lord. And the letter opens with two titles for Jesus, and they're really important for our understanding of this letter. It says, he who is first and last, and who died and came to life again, because this is what Jesus offers to these situations. He who is first and last, which is um, an Old Testament title that belongs to God, and it's a promise. Jesus is with us from the first day of creation to the last day of earth. Who then can we be afraid of? He outlives everyone and everything. And it's a warning that not Smyrna, nor Edinburgh, Europe, America, or China, no leader, any individual striving to be better than the rest. It is Christ who is first and Christ who will be last. And in comparison to Christ, all these earthly distinctions are worthless. The street of gold, the ornament of Asia, the amazing trade routes, they're worthless when you see them from God's perspective. This is the death of human pride and ambition. Human titles are insignificant and their claims are ridiculous. I'm fortunate that I've actually been to some of these places that the letters are written to. I've been to both Ephesus and to Shimona. And I went because I wanted to go and see the seven ancient wonders of the world. And um, the Temple of Artemis is one of the seven ancient wonders of the world, and it's not far from Ephesus. And um, the things that are written about it was that it was enormous. It was twice the size of the Parthenon, and it was known for its awesome beauty. And people would travel from all over to come and see this wonder of the world. It was powerful and it was rich. And the people reading this letter were probably persecuted by those because they would have refused to worship Artemis. And I went to see it. I wanted to see all the seven wonders of the world. But here's the thing. I struggled to find the temple to Artemis. I got a small local bus to the location. My companion and I were the only people there. There were no signs no tours, no loyal worshippers, no giant temple. There was a few muddy puddles and there were some geese and there was a small column standing amongst the puddles. Nothing even really to take a photograph of. Jesus is the first and the last. He was here before the creation of Rome, before Smyrna, before Edinburgh, for any of the seven wonders of the world, and he'll be here at the end, long after it is all gone. And the second title that Jesus has given in the letter is he who died and came to life again. And the Greek here is a bit of a clumsy translation, and it means basically that death was a passing phase. He became dead and then he passed through it and he is alive again. He came to life again. He's referencing his resurrection from the dead. 
Christ is the only one to have truly experienced death and then to return to life again. The triumph of the resurrection, the triumph over death. He is alive now and will be forevermore. He was the first. He passed through death and he's alive now. He has already experienced the worst that life could do. Whatever happens in Smyrna, in your life, in life, it's very worst. The bitterness of death, Jesus has overcome it. Not only has he overcome it, he's conquered it. He's triumphed over it. And he offers us, through himself, a way to victorious living. The only demand in this letter is loyalty. Loyalty to Christ brings its own rewards. Verse 10 says, be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. And the victor's crown is a New Testament reference that we see in James and 2 Timothy, the crown of righteousness. Paul contrasts the immortal crown of Christ, the unfading crown of glory, with the fading, the fading crown of the laurels of the games. It was made of joy and victory, and it's the crown of victory in the contest of life. It suggests the faithful service is rewarded with the joy of entering into the presence of God and sitting as a guest at his banquet feast. A crown of thorns in life is replaced by a crown of glory in the life to come. And this second promise is a curious one. This second promise that they will not be hurt by the second death. It's not thought to refer to physical death, the first death that we all experience. The second death seems to refer to the final judgment of God, after which his enemies will experience eternal death and his people will experience eternal life. God's people should have no fear of death. It has been overcome. What crushes us in life cannot hurt us in eternity. God places his hands in ours and he leads us through. So whatever is crushing you, when something threatens to squeeze the life and the faith out of you, remember that God sees you. He sees you and he knows you and he sends you these love letters. Carry on being faithful and you will wear a crown of glory in the life to come. Because Jesus is the first and the last. Let's pray. Loving Father, thank you for your amazing love that you are the first and the last. Guide us with your Holy Spirit. Protect us from that which threatens to crush us. Give us your words when we need them most. Grant us ears to hear and a heart that is open. Be with us and bless us, we pray. Amen.